Hello, everybody. Welcome in. Welcome in. Happy Friday. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, <laughs> uh, the purgatory demo if you saw it yesterday. If you didn't, it's going up on YouTube in just a couple of hours. Uh, I'll be all up there after the stream is over. Hi. Hello, everyone in the chat. Um, so something I have to say right uh, at the top, um, the, well, there was another update to Book of Hungry Names, so I had to quickly run through the chapter again, which is the second time this has happened. Um, and the only difference from, I, I made all the same choices, but the only difference from before to now of the adventure of uh, Guy as Deadly as Weasel, me, is uh, the first time I attempted to sabotage the cultists' um, vehicles, and I was successful. This time, I was not successful, and instead I got shot. <laughs> and ran away. Um, so, so that's the difference. Um, I failed. Which is probably what should have happened the first time. I probably shouldn't have been that lucky. But everything else was the same. The tree fell on me. Every Everything else was exactly the same as before. Um, and so what we are doing, in case you have forgotten, is we are looking for Melody Palace, who is a Silver Fang, um, who is in this town called Ashfield. And um, she is uh, under the influence, and the whole town is under the influence of this spirit called, I believe, the Summer King. And uh, it's bad. And they're right now having sort of a midsummer... Um, festival um which they aren't doing it on the actual time of midsummer on the actual summer solstice they're doing it a little bit early which has made elton mad because you know he's a theurge and he wants that you know <laughs> he wants things to go according to what his calculations are um but obviously that's not happening and so we we us sierra um, so a more canon run. That's right, Jerry. <laughs> that's a more canon. Uh, so we ran back to the um, B and B to get our stuff, and we found some of Elton's notes. And then we ran to the library and got um, a book on the Harvest Rite, which um, is all the same from last time. And now we have run back <laughs> to um, Nin and Elton, who are waiting for us. And the, as I said, the um, festival or the procession of these cultists going down the street has already started, even though Elton insists that it's not time yet for the festival, according to his calculations, according to when the summer solstice is. So we run back with our stuff, and that's where we are. But you're all caught up. <laughs> I really hope I can get through the rest of this before there's any more updates, because Kyle's amazing, and we'll keep writing stuff and uh, fixing stuff uh, in quick time. But anyway, let's begin. If you are ready, I'm ready. <clears throat> the procession, meaning the procession of cultists, emerges from the thinning fog and crosses the wide grassy field around the outdoor theater. Do you see Mr. Ware? Elton asks. You shake your head. Of course, he's probably ditched his green coveralls for the ceremony. Now, Mr. Ware, Elijah Ware, was the guy with the sickles um, who was in the same place where Melody was hiding. Melody walks behind the multitude, and now she's with us, dressed in a gown and an, and an elaborate fanned headdress, surrounded by masked guards armed with shotguns and silver sickles. You were right about the sickles, Elton says, and you're ready for them, but they're still troubling. <laughs> Are we ready for silver sickles? I don't know. Behind Melody, two men carry what first looks like a gilded cauldron covered in grasses and lit torches. As it gets closer, you realize that it's a huge pumpkin, intricately carved with ritual scenes and inlaid with gold. The king, Nin says, nodding toward the container. So that's his tabernacle or whatever it's called. I was able to um, talk to one of the priests. It was horrible, Nin says. Don't pretend you're all squeamish, Nin, Elton says. Anyway, I asked him some questions, and I think I understand the outline of this rite. It's a marriage, oh my god, it's a marriage ritual, repeated three times per year between the Triple King, currently in his summer form as the Summer King, and Melody. And it's a sacrifice. Blood will flow tonight. I wish I knew more, though. <laughs> Does this help? You ask, holding up the harvest rite. Great Gaia, Elton says. How did you get this? Um, Elton... I'm really not trying not to kill a bunch of people tonight. Let's find something in here so we don't have to. <laughs> Elton, shut up. <laughs> is what I say. <laughs> so we're as ready for as we possibly... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're super ready. We're so ready. We didn't uh, go Krynos just to have a giant uh, tree bane fall on us. That didn't happen. Nope. We're, we're the readiest. <laughs> 
Elton reads frantically as he talks. Okay, we're looking at a kind of ritual narrative. This is incredible. I see evidence of Siberian shamanism in the separation and reintegration of times and places. In this context, it symbolizes the physical and spiritual dissection of the shaman hero and his reintegration transformed and perfected. But more importantly, this ritual requires four participants. Melody, the summer, Melody, the summer king, a hero, and a kind of dragon or monster figure. I want to be the dragon. I have an idea, Sierra. If you could take on the uh, on the role of the hero, you could symbolically thwart this ritual, disrupting the Summer King's hold over the town and letting us rescue Melody, and perhaps grab this spirit. Grab it, you ask? How many Garu can command delusion powers like the Summer King wields, Elton says. Might that not be useful as we rebuild? Oh my god, Delulu powers, I want them. If you can weaken it enough through ritual, Melody or I might be able to command it, aw. I know we're, you know, busy, but it's something to consider. Yeah, why me? You're the Thayerge. I'm a Ragabash. <laughs> I mean, not that I don't, I think a Ragabash should get to have mind wibbly wobbly powers. That's just me. I do love that we lost a fight to a tree. Such a tough thing to do. Well, that's me. That's me. Nin and I both belong to tribes. Way to rub it in, Elton says. I don't think Unicorn or... Vaha, vaga, thunder, just say thunder, Elton, would let us participate. Or more accurately, I think it's impossible for us to participate. But if I'm going to play the hero, you observe, the first step is getting a costume. I think that's him, Elton says, pointing to a man not far from Melody. Melody's my sister's name, but it's weird to keep saying it. A middle-aged man with a face lined beneath a heavy beard. He looks like one of the many drifters and wanderers you've met over the years. His expression shows a mix of exultation and fear mixed with heavy intoxication. He staggers a little as he walks. He's dressed in ceremonial armor and wears a wooden sword at his waist. Let's grab him and take the costume, Elton says. I love it. The energies here are strange. Are you sure we're not already being mentally influenced? Ooh! That's a good question. I don't think Sierra's smart enough to think of that question, but I would love to know the answer to that question. And as the Thayer should know the answer to that question, I hope. <laughs> to take part in the right, Elton says. It's a possibility, but I think that we're in a race with the Summer King to ruin the right. He wants to ruin it by sacrificing that poor man, as he derives power from the act of transgression. We need to ruin it first. And looking at the assembled crowd, I feel like we're the only lucid ones in attendance. God, I hope you're right. Elton might be right. People are glassy-eyed and vacant, and even the guards seem lost. The procession files down toward the barn you were just in and forms a loose semicircle. Sickle-armed guards herd the hero and a dazed-looking melody toward an open patch of grass. Others set down the gilded pumpkin that contains the Summer King and run chains between it and the stage. Lucy Shea lights two rows of copper braziers, marking a path between the stage and the pond. The owner of the B&B wears a deer mask, and from the way she walks, she's armed with more than just a torch. Great! Spiritual energy floods out of the pumpkin. The grass ripples and the fog swirls. There's more chatter from the police radios. The Summer King is strong, Elton says, but not invincible. If we carry off this right well enough, I think we might be able to bind him. That might be useful. Not many Garu can manipulate people's thoughts and sense impressions. And if we could weaken him enough that Melody or I could, you already said this, Elton. CB3, do you copy? I repeat, the intruders are moving towards the lake. Do you copy? Oh no. But the police and guards don't respond. It's like they can't hear it, Elton whispers. Nin points her snout toward another peculiar sight. Yeah, the CK okay, so see here? Here... In in the before times, I I sabotaged these vehicles, but as I said, I failed the role um, when I was catching up to the chapter, and so now I didn't. A jeep rumbles across the grass, then slows to a halt. The driver gets out, confused, and stares at the jeep like it's nothing he's ever seen before. You're not sure, but you think the people of Ashfield are mentally regressing further, so far that they can't understand radios or internal combustion engines. That's great. This ritual is ridiculous. We're ripping these cultists apart right now. No, we literally said we don't want to kill the town, so let's not do that. Um, I don't want to kill half this town. Let me return to my Hamid form and I'll take part in the rite. Um, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Let's do that. Give me a second, Elton says. <laughs> I don't want to tear apart the town. Shadows spread toward the armored hero. 
Elton crawls toward him on all fours, slipping effortlessly past the deer masked Mrs. Shea and avoiding the light of her braziers. There's a thump in the darkness, and a moment later, Elton returns, carrying the drifter over his shoulder. He sets the, sh the terrified man down and says, It's your lucky day, my friend. No one is slitting your throat. As he speaks, he strips the man of his costume. Unless they catch you, I encourage you to run. The man runs, vanishing into the fog. You return to your Hamid form, then don the bronze armor, the ceremonial sword, and the mitre of the hero. It's interesting, Elton observes. What? Oh, I was in Galabro form, by the way, to regenerate, because I had to hurt myself, because I got shot, as I mentioned. It's interesting, Elton observes, what constitutes a serious obstacle for the Garu and what does not. Nin, I want you to watch our escape route to the south. I'll stay close and grab Melody if we get the chance. Then a voice rings out across the field. Of what use is the sun if the rains never end? Of what use is summer if the grain rots, if the rats multiply? When will the wheel turn? Who will tame this fecundity? <laughs> I love that word. That's Melody, resplendent in her headdress of woven grass, standing on a raised wooden platform between the two barns. She stands next to the rune-carved pumpkin where the Summer King resides and surrounded by robed men with torches. All eyes turn to you. There's no recognition of anything unusual in their vacant gazes. By contrast, Melody seems entirely lucid now. Her expression alternately shows anticipation, dread, and terrible rage. It's time. You approach the stage. This can only go well. <laughs> <laughs> down with the useless day star <laughs> i agree the vampires would love that <clears throat> the ritual opens with a long monologue by melody as she speaks she surreptitiously hands you a pamphlet containing the text of the play just like you thought this is a rather simplistic hero's journey plot it involves a young hero in a kingdom blighted by spring rains that will not end who travel to a faraway land fights the hot hey, that's either Red, Hot is German for red, or it's Rot. I'm not sure which one it is. I'm going to say Hot. Hot dragon and recovers the jewel of the sun to banish the rains and bring about high summer. Your frantic reading reveals three acts. The initial journey to the land of jewels, the battle against the Hot dragon, and the tricky negotiation to get the Lady of Summer, that's Melody, to accept the jewel of the sun and a marriage offer. The only problem is that your dialogue has been crossed out and rewritten multiple times, producing a confused palimpsest of motivations and personalities for the hero. Oh my god. The handwriting is different each time, too. Melody's ringing voice fades and the chorus starts up. Who will stop the rains and how? Who will... As they chant, Melody leans towards you and whispers, You've met the Summer King before. He's like any other spirit. Bind him with who you are, Sierra. Command him with your own. Is there anyone brave enough? The chorus booms. Is there anyone true enough? That's your cue. You step forward, drawing a hundred vacant gazes. Not even the priests seem to realize that you're not the drifter. Spiritual energy boils from the huge cauldron-like pumpkin as you speak the printed lines. I will do this thing. I will fight this thing. I will find this thing. I will earn the love of the Lady of Summer. But how, the chorus intones, how will you cross the flooded lands to the mountain where beauty shines? All who have tried have perished. Here's where the text turns into a palimpsest. You scan the many possible lines, seeking one that's in accord with your nature and speak. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, hi, Matt. <laughs> Welcome in. <laughs> this is fine. I have friends to aid me among the regular folk who I tr whose trust I enjoy. I know the spirits of those lands and seek their aid. I have secured myself a chariot and can protect myself. I have friends um, to aid me among... I would love to have more friends. I would love to have more friends. I mean, we have Nin and Elton. And Nin is a great friend. I'd like to have more. Bind him with who you are, prepares to fuck up until he gives up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh i know i know it's so bad um i have friends to aid me among the regular folk whose trust i enjoy is what i will say and we'll see how this goes five men and women step out of the audience and lead you down toward the lake though they seem restive and dissatisfied as if they don't entirely believe the hero's commitment to helping regular people the pumpkin strains and shivers pulsing with power as the summer king plans his escape the audience that gathers around the lake seems vaguely hostile, but they don't move against you. Melody, waiting on stage, looks worried. I, I obviously picked the right one. 
The choral recitation starts up again. Guards carry the pumpkin down slope past the braziers to your location and veil it behind tacky looking cut glass palm leaves. The chorus describes the hero's victories and travails. You act them out according to the stage directions you've been given, lulling the audience deep into a hypnotic state. Then Melody cries, Beware, hero! The Roach Dragon rises! And I get I'm saying Roach because Roach, I believe it's Red Dragon. It's probably not Rot Dragon. Uh, maybe it is, I don't know. Even as she speaks, a man dressed all in black and gray rises out of the pond, water streaming down his metal scales, which glimmer faintly in the torchlight. Maybe it is Rot Dragon. It's Elijah Ware. He regards you with the same cold, barely suppressed hatred you saw in his eyes the first time he looked at you, seated at the B&B. The same hatred you've seen all over town these past few days. Mr. Ware recites his lines with vigor, describing the dragon's various modes and methods of invincibility. The recitation goes on for long enough that you're able to scan your lines again as your companions move into position around the lake. Then the chorus chants again, How will you overcome the dragon, O hero? is the gist of it, and you're on again. You, <laughs> you flip through the palimpsest, hoping one of these lines will resonate with the Summer King and with your own nature. Okay, I'm a Ragabash. Which is more roguelike than bard-like. I was gonna say I use jokes and tricks to beguile the dragon, fooling it so it exposes its weakness. I think that's the most Ragabash one. I defeat the road dragon by following and invoking the law as I'm a faithful servant of the gods and my kingdom's elders. I mean, that sort of plays into my, as, if, as we recall, my weird, the litany sustains us, um... <laughs> thing that I somehow got on. Um, my wrath and fury will grant me victory over the Roach Dragon. Um, so do I go weird litany? Do I lean even further into like, cause obviously I imagine that these choices play into um, different stats that you get. So um, do I do this one or do I use, do I lean into my Ragabash or lean into my love of the litany? I don't know. Bonar. I love the Bonar. All right. Um, I think, I don't know. <laughs> I think, I don't know. It's definitely not this one. That's for sure. I wonder if it's Colt or Red. I really wish I knew. I mean, it's it's all in English, so I assume it's Rot Dragon. But Colt's Dragon sounds better because a Red Dragon is just more classic. I'm going to say Defeat. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be the Litany stand and lean into the Litany. That's my decision. Despite Elijah's men metal fangs, this conflict is largely symbolic, and you struggle to articulate the nature of your victory. Though you recite the lines scribbled in the margins about your lawful authority, the crowd seems hostile or indifferent. Elijah Ware only weakens because it's in the script, and he looks annoyed at having to sink down to his knees in the tepid water. You continue the ritual symbolically claiming the chain-wrapped pumpkin that represents the Jewel of the Sun, and then preparing to set out on your return journey where you'll use the gem God, to banish the defiling rains and marry the Lady of Summer. As you recite the words of binding over the pumpkin, you can feel the Summer King fighting you. His power is incredible, and it feels like he could seize control of this rite at any time. You need to focus on harmonizing with your own nature in order to bind him to your will. The chorus recites more lines you frantically read ahead. Next, the Roach Dragon is supposed to lash out dramatically and then whisper dire warnings into your ear as it dies. Instead, Elijah Ware creeps forward and you see him pull a knife, a real knife, against a spray-painted cardboard breastplate. It looks like Elijah's going off script. Great. He wades through the knee-deep water, utility knife gleaming in the light of the brazers. That's fun. That's super fun. He has a knife! <laughs> That's super fun. Um... Okay, I don't want to do this. I mean, I do. Snarling with rage, I kick Elijah into the water, ending the right attack. I've come too far, though. I've read too many goofy-ass lines <laughs> to, to end it this way. That That's the last possible thing. I, I committed to the right, and I want to keep going. Um, I don't kill him, but I hurt him enough to frighten him. Ooh, I could do that. That seems like a good middle ground, right? I keep the narrative going, symbolically killing the dragon and relying on Elijah's sense of reverence and fear. I quickly take the knife and stab him. No, I just enjoy, endure the knife moon. I could take it and keep going. I don't kill him. I hurt him enough to frighten him. That seems like a good middle ground to me just freaking out because I kind of enjoy it when I freak out. 
You're not getting stabbed for this fool's pride. You stand your ground, snarling with rage, and Elijah's hand falters. You shove him back into the water, then deliberately turn your back on the priest and begin reciting your next lines about claiming the jewel of the sun. As his guards freeze in shock, they alone seem to understand what you've done. The summer king shivers with rage. Oopsies. Oh, I made a mistake. Shivers with rage inside his carved enclosure, furious that you're starting to gain the upper hand in this obtruse contest of spiritual authority. Singing and festive drumming accompany your victorious return to your native kingdom with the jewel of the sun in tow. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Your allies position nearby, tense and get ready to attack as the summer king rises out of his tabernacle. For a moment, he is only a point of gravity, sucking in air and fog, and then roots and grasses and ritual dolls fly up into the air. And he looms over the assembly, twice the height of a man, shining like a bonfire to drive off the rains. It's hard to make sense of the fire or light that surrounds him. It's dingy and rusty. Then you realize that it's old blood, old sacrifices. The king is ablaze with the heart's blood of his cult's offering. Oh my god. The radiance is what remains of last season's blood. But the spirit wants more. You wince at the flagrant violation of the veil, the part of the litany that demands both Garu and spirits avoid the notice of regular people. The chorus chants as you hike back up the hill between the oil brazers. They describe how the jewel of the sun banishes the rains before the land rots. So it must be must be the rot dragon. Oh, whatever. Melody sidle, sidles up to you. You think the triple king's power is starting to affect you too. Since at first, oh my god, you see her as the lady of summer, not a worried looking young woman in an oversized headdress. What exactly do you think you're doing? She whispers as the chorus chants around the stage and Elijah Ware crawls through the muck down by the pond. <laughs> We're putting the pack back together. <laughs> um. Why would I say this now? The truth is hard, but I need to learn what happened at Battlegrave's farm. That's it's kind of not the time to talk about that right now. Um. We're planning to bind the Summer King and use his powers to keep us safe. Is that allowed? Melody says. You shrug. The last thing you want to do is argue the litany with a Silver Fang Felidox. It might be possible, though, you say, if we can just beat him down enough with his own right. I like the idea of beating him down, Melody says. And sticking him in a little box? Even better. He's still fighting, but you may be able to defeat him during the, uh, calling of the bride. You flip through the book. Your final task is to persuade the Lady of Summer that you're a worthy bridegroom. <laughs> Poitigam, as we'd say here in Germany. Once that's done, Melody whispers before she gets back into position, you'll have to survive the Summer King breaking the narrative. That's what he does, you understand. He feeds on these people through willful violation of the right by stepping out of the narrative and killing the hero. Oh my god. He killed someone this spring and now you've taken that drifter's place. He's going to kill you. Wait, so how can I, you start to say, the hero returns, the chorus chants. His bride awaits, but look, she hesitates on the threshold. To slay the roach dragon is brave, or roach dragon is brave, but killing defiles the spirit. What can he say to persuade her that his intentions are pure? You look around for Elton, interested in any advice he can offer about the Summer King killing you, but you don't see him. Oh, hero, Melody intones, climbing past the chains up onto the stage. Why should I love a slayer? Right, you're on. You ascend the stage to stand beside Melody. <laughs> the laws of the common people are as nothing, for we are not common people. We punish them for what we do freely. This is so funny. This is, like, hilarious. Yeah, priority, Sierra. A deep dive backstory can wait. I know. I don't know why it's an option. <laughs> I was hes I was tempted to ask. <laughs> Melody would have given it to Harado right then because, like, I'm her only hope. <laughs> oh. Melody, the Lady of Summer, nods desperately as you speak, but it doesn't seem to be enough. The crowd grumbles, dissatisfied with your interpretation of the wedding vows, and the Summer King shines bright and fierce. Then all at once, the false reality conjured by the rite dissolves. The pumpkin shudders and opens, and the Summer King rises up into the air. For a moment, he is only a point of gravity, sucking in air and fog, and then roots and grasses and ritual dolls fly up into the air, and he looms over the assembly as a knight wearing a sunburst mask and armed with a burning sword. He's, 
and it's important to remember that Sierra has no charisma. He's a horrible patchwork thing, hungry and flawed, and though his leaf and root mouth opens as if to issue commands, you only hear a roar like a raging inferno. <laughs> People scream in confusion and terror, fleeing in every direction, some falling into the water. Masked guards armed with shotguns or silver sickles move your way. The Summer King roars, rising high above the field and shining now with a pure white light, as if he could usurp the moon herself. People seem determined to rush the stage and Melody snarls. The real threats coming from two directions. First, local hunters and police in the audience are now closing in with shotguns and rifles. Second, the Summer King's guards have drawn their silver sickles and are fighting their way through the panicked crowd to the stairs of the stage. Even as the fog blows off, revealing the full extent of the chaos, you spot the black you Oh no, not the tree again! Drifting over the pond. You shout a warning as it sweeps down over the grass and smashes into Nin. The galliard howls in surprise, then turns and starts biting the tree's branches, ripping into bark, wood, and black meat as they both drift over the crowd. Jesus Christ. So obviously, I am doing great. I didn't fuck this up at all. Tumbling through the sky, they smash into the big barn, tearing away most of its upper story, then vanish behind the building and out of your line of sight. You don't see any way to control the Summer King now. <laughs> I'm sorry! I don't have any charisma! But you can still get Melody safely into the woods. Or if you rip up enough of these priests and zealots, you might even be able to free the town from the spirit's tyranny. I lost? I lost. Wait a minute, I'm not supposed to lose. Let me see the script. <laughs> I mean... I am not smart or charismatic. What is my charisma? It's nothing. I never, I don't like looking at my attributes. It's one. There was no way I was going to be able to pull this off. Not manipulation is two, maybe, but there was no way. Not a chance. Okay. Um, I draw. Ooh, yeah, I have some, I have some, some dots and aim. I draw my throwing knives and hurl them at the guards with shotguns. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably bad, too. Leave it to a werewolf to bring a knife to a gunfight. But when you check, it turns out that you actually have ten knives. And there are only, um, five guys with sickles and eight with shotguns. So maybe this can work. <laughs> That's thirteen, Sierra. <laughs> Oh no, I can't count either. As the hunters and off-duty cops fan out to surround you and Melody and set up overlapping fields of shotgun fire, you jump off the stage, draw a fistful of knives, and rush the closest target as he kneels and takes aim. He turns, but not quickly enough, and your knife thunks into his neck. When you hear movement behind- Remember I said I didn't want to kill everyone? Oh well, so much for that. When you hear movement behind you, you drop and a round flies over you to hit a woman in the chest. You roll and toss a blade sideways, catching your attacker across the knuckles as he tries to reload. He drops his shotgun with a curse as you finish your roll, lunge towards him, and slash him across the eyes. A wave of priests armed with sickles forces you back. You stab one with your bloody knife, then throw it into the foot of another attacker. Then you draw more knives, spin and throw, but the blade sticks in your next target's deer mask. Oh no! Mrs. Shea laughs, rise, raises her shotgun, and then turns and tries to run. She manages two strides before Melody, in her monstrous Krynos warform, hits her with one claw. Her top half flies off into the lake and lands with many little dribbling splashes. The bottom half keeps running for a while. That's an image. You've lost zero, King, Melody snarls as the villagers flee in every direction. These people won't bow to you again. No more sacrifices. No more twisting their minds. I mean, she's in Krynos form, so that's kind of hard to, to speak that way, unless she's speaking the Garu tongue, I think. <clears throat> no, Elijah Ware screams, stumbling out of the pond. He has an antique revolver, and you spot a gleam in the chamber as the radiance cast by the Summer King falls upon it. Silver bullets. We don't need you, bitch. We can rebuild. We can remake the world. Die! He doesn't notice the shadows boiling around his ankles until Elton materializes and shoves his clawed hand through his back so it bursts out his chest, alien style. The Theurge flings the corpse into the pond. The Philodox wrenches a 50-pound stone out of the ground. Melody! The Summer King roars, shining overhead. You can't leave! You belong to... The Philodox hurls the stone, which arcs through the night air and hits the carved pumpkin, shattering it like glass. The Summer King howls, then flees, abandoning his body so the roots and leaves and little dolls fall like rain. He can spend the next thousand years hiding in a tree, Melody snarls, trying to rebuild his strength. 
and it was going so well. <laughs> <laughs> then it was chaos. That's how I roll, baby. You flee into the woods for a few minutes, but then everyone seems to remember that you left your attackers dead and mangled, and there's no reason to run. Everyone stops in an open glade to change back to their Hamid form or lupus form for Nin. Next, a few confused minutes with phone flashlights and plastic bags full of clothes as everyone gets dressed. Melody's hair is larger than the headdress she wore as the Lady of Summer. She keeps trying to push it down. What happened to my barrows, she asked, while I was away. Uh, David Beninsky took them over and turned into into a fomor, Elton says. Don't worry, I killed him. <laughs> Don't worry, I killed him. He's dead now. I never liked that gun nut, Melody says. What did he do to the place? Gross things, really gross things. We reversed most of the damage, Elton says. He built a dam, mutilated horses until they became infected with banes. There's still a lot of work to do there, though. Then I know where I'm going, the Philodox says. Did he use my house? Your house? Elton asks, surprised. I guess he didn't, Melody says. Elton and Melody chat easily as they walk through the dark woods, as if they haven't seen each other for three days instead of three years. Only when the conversation turns to those, those they've lost, Elton's wife Catherine, Melody's sister Harmony, parents, friends, humans, and Garu all gone, does the conversation grow tense. With the three families all but extinct and the werewolf elders dead, Elton and Melody are the most senior of the Garu. The Shadow Lord and the Silver Fang are the last heirs of a dead hierarchy. That's so true. And you can almost feel their friendship straining as they instinctively vie for dominance. I love it. You're starting to wonder if you're just going to walk the five hours back to Northampton when Roscoe's van rolls up. Melody, he says. He sounds almost too stunned for emotion. Roscoe, you're looking well, Melody says. You look, like, you look like they buried you alive, girl, Roscoe says. Everyone get in. There's uh, reports of a flying tree and I want to go home. <laughs> That's such a mood. It's such a mood. I hate that flying tree. That's my number one enemy in this game. Melody and Elton spend the drive back discussing boring logistical issues like getting the Philodox a new laptop and updating her state ID. You had hoped to see one of the old palace mansions, but Roscoe drops you off outside your gambrel. Oh, is this the place you meant? Elody a Melody asks Elton when she sees it. Isn't this the place where Kate and Knife Eyes... Don't tell her, Elton whispers as you jump out of the van. Then he leans forward to talk to Roscoe. Sierra, Melody says, leaning out of the van. Thank you. I need to start rebuilding the barrows, but you and I need to talk more. Come and see me when you can. Yes, I will be coming for backstory. <laughs> you nod, then watch as the van reverses and trundles back up the dirt road, leaving you alone. First Nin, now Melody. Podge the Bone Gnar is apparently south of you in the city of Holyoke, but he can wait until tomorrow. You stumble inside around 3 a.m., so tired your bones ache, and barely manage to pull your leather boots off before you topple into bed. You don't dream at all. Oh, that's so nice for me. That's great. Whoa, you have over a thousand dollars. How? Did I steal from someone? <laughs> Did I take money from somebody? I don't remember. You, or was this just from being paid? You might want to take some days for yourself, helping your human allies in exchange for training and support. I have a thousand dollars? Dang. I'm the best. Where can I see my money? <laughs> oh, I lost my convictions. I lost my convictions for the litany. <laughs> what happened? Oh no, I don't know what happened. And also, ha I had more dots than humans must understand. Probably because I killed some. Our weapon is our rage. Oh, God. I have totally changed up my convictions so super hardcore I through that stupid summer gig ritual. God. <laughs> I can't see my money. You take a trip to the post office one morning before your Gorski Manor shift, and to your surprise, you have a letter. It's from Black Tarn. Oh, my God. You tear it open and read the jagged penmanship. I am sorry for waiting so long. While I suppose none of us are well, I know Clay's dead, I am as well as I can be given the circumstances. Scarper has disappeared. Oh God, he's coming to find me. And I have been dealing with the local concerns that I'm sure you're familiar with. So I will not bore you with the details. However, several of my local concerns point east just as yours did. And since none of our people remain here, I am considering a trip to Northampton once I deal with certain upstart humans and their tricks. Yes, come, come. I hope your new home has treated you better than your old one. More to follow. BT. Oh, 
You make sure to write back, carefully eluding any details <laughs> that might identify you as a werewolf since physical letters are far from secure. I would love to help people out with money. I'm not sure how I do that, but that's cool. Yeah, I really don't get the money in this game. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Okay, let's let's take a moment. We obviously want to talk to Melody, um, but let's take a moment to do some little things. Check my phone. Ooh, that's a lot. Oh, I checked my bank statement. Okay, all right, we'll take it all in turn order here. Um, email from Elton, the Triple King. Yeah. What, what the fuck was that about? <laughs> I've been conducting more research about the Summer King that impressed imprisoned Melody. One book I was able to talk about find talks about a triple king found in the pagan beliefs of what is now Poland and the Czech Republic. That is where the three families were originally from. Apparently, the triple king was once a much more significant figure than the one we encountered. Perhaps we're lucky we were able to stop him when we did. Without Garu to watch over the Umbra, spirits like this grow ambitious and cruel, even those that are not of the worm, as Garu orthodoxy understands the concept. That's fair. Okay, cool. Um, email from Roscoe, COF point men. I don't know what that is, so I want to read it. I ran this by the media lady, Daphne, and she said it was okay to talk about it here. Of <laughs> the glass walker. A security guy I've used before named Conrad Merritt works for the Fenris, or the sort of nationalist groups we regular folks use when we want to be hateful, I guess. I had no idea. He was an airman and he knew sound systems and could keep a crowd in line. Never had a problem with him, but now he's gone. A ghost. Can't find him anywhere. I know because we killed him. Or Nin did because we used him to bring Nin back, I'm pretty sure is the guy. Uh, he's CC'd Elton and Melody. A moment later, Elton's response pops up. Thank you, Roscoe. I discourage you from investigating this man on your own. We will look into it. Wasn't he the guy that we had Nin kill? I'm pretty sure. Um, I checked my bank statements. You're doing well. You've been able to keep at least $1,000 in your bank account lately, and you have some 20s in your wallet. Maybe you should cut down your hours at Gorski Manor, take a few days off, and train. Maybe you should not tell me what to do. Um, Black Shuck Strikes Back. Ghost Dog Mayhem at Aztec-style Ashfield Sacrifice. Oh, God. Black Shuck Strikes Back. Okay, so I read that. Um, Witnesses to an... <laughs> To an Aztec or Polish-Lithuanian-style human sacrifice report sighting of Black Shuck, legendary hell dog of the Pioneer Valley. <laughs> That's Elton. Black Shuck sightings date back to 1846 when Old Palace constructed his mansion in Williamsburg, Massachusetts. Despite a dearth of sightings between the wars and also after the wars until the 21st century, Black Shuck fans in both the U.S. and the U.K. have reported an uptick in sightings all over Massachusetts, including this one after a violent battle during a failed sacrifice. Related, do obsidian Aztec sacrifice knives circulate in your children's Halloween candy? God, I hope so. The ritual sacrifice of the Pumpkin Queen is an annual ceremony in Ashfield and related communities, but never before has it turned violent instead of symbolic. The article rambles for five more confused paragraphs. Nomi has no idea what they're talking about, but you don't like this black shuck business since local paranormal enthusiasts might be talking about Elton. They're absolutely talking about Elton. That's so funny. Uh, the uh, the music venue, okay. You read the article with increasing bewilderment as you don't remember any of this. The fight at the infamous music venue, right? Sure, there were some werewolf rough roughhousing, but there weren't any arrests. One of the deputies even apologized to Roscoe for their bad information. You text the promoter. That all happened at an after party. That's from Roscoe. Not an officially sanctioned one or anything, just the drummers from Scritti Ligotti and St. Homunculus got together. And the drummer from Psycho Pompadour and I think and I think silent sinus too. I know you're young and don't need an old man's advice, but my advice is never go to an all drummer after party. So it's got nothing to do with us. No, you did great. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Thanks, Roscoe. I really like Roscoe a lot. And the final one, the revised Green Correctional Consortium Sustainability Forecast. I hate. That's a terrible name. As correctional and holding facilities become more important due to the growing instability caused by climate change, the Green Correctional Consortium is dedicated to reducing the environmental impact of correctional operations across the northeastern United States. This seems sussy. Initial rollouts in Maine and Connecticut promise to revolutionize the design and management of correctional facilities, minimizing environmental harm and maximizing security in our uncertain area. Hampshire and Middlesex County, Middlesex County is where I grew up, in Massachusetts are currently bidding on developmental opportunities under the revised Green Correctional Consortium Sustainability System, COD, which plans for rapid rollout in case of environmental emergencies or civil unrest or solar panels. Read more. Procter & Gamble's goals that inspire environmental stewardship increases financial commitment 300,000 for East Coast tornado and severe storm beliefs. Circinus leads with love and latest trash that butt program. <laughs> Sorry about cigarettes. Okay. It seems like a Pentex front, but sure. 
Okay, God. Um, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Um, yes. <laughs> That's too many. It's too much. Okay, I... I, I need to take time to, to do stuff for myself. I need to go to Roscoe's van. Oh yeah, uh, right. Nomi is is the person we met in um, at the. Uh, good lord, Nomi was the person we met at the. Uh, why my brain is not working at Hog Throne, right? At the 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 band band <laughs> music venue. <laughs> my brain's totally fried this week. It's all over, guys. It's done. Okay. I, 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 what can I learn from, from Roscoe? Maybe I should up my charisma. I have 12 free days. Maybe I should up my charisma. Maybe I should get a point of investigation because I kind of suck at it. Is my thoughts. I saved you read an article by the way. <laughs> <laughs> like it's been a long week <laughs> my brain is just totally what should i focus on yeah help me out bro physical attributes like stamina will help you at gorski manor all right i'll take your advice you're awesome stamina four days done done baby um it didn't up my stamina i just want you to know that i still have 12 days so can i please do stamina no Okay, it won't let me up my stamina for some reason. That's odd. Is that a, is that a, 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 is it broken? Let's try again. Stamina. Nope. I can't. Okay, Roscoe, I'll come back. <laughs> Restore the glory of Broadbrook Garu, huh? What? What? <laughs> I just got a I just got a I just got an achievement called Legacy of Glory. I am so very confused. What's happening? Oh, you need to buy a bike to raise physical stats. How do I buy a bike? How do I buy a bike? It just says I it just it, it, and also it says that I I just got uh, an achievement for restoring the Broadbrook Cairn. I don't think I did do that yet. But all right. I'll take it. Um, what does Hoblin think I should learn? Physical strength? Like, str okay, so everyone wants me to do physical stuff. How do I buy a bike? You get a text as you eat lunch halfway through a double shift at Gorski Manor. Melody says we need to look at the brick tombs in Hadley and fix them. I know. You remember those strange beehive tombs on the way to Hog Throne Show? So many things around Broadbrook require maintenance and there aren't enough werewolves to handle everything. But Elton seems unsettled by the tombs, so you make a mental note to deal with them soon. You spend your lunch break texting with Nin, who is a bad speller but enthusiastic conversationalist, especially on the subject of music. It's only when you're back to scrubbing the grout in the staff bathrooms that you realize you don't know how to repair haunted tombs or even what those tombs really are. You'll have to ask one of your fellow Garu, probably Melody, she deals with the dead. Yes, I would like to buy... I would like to buy a bicycle. There we go, right there, baby. Buy me a bicycle. The first step to getting a bike is learning more about bikes because you know enough to fix one, but not enough to get a good deal. After a few hours of online research, you've learned that you can't afford anything good from Amazon or any of the larger stores. So you start calling around and checking Craigslist. Online sources offer nothing but junk, but after working off and on for a few days, you get a lead on a good bike at a shop across the Connecticut River in Hadley. With the afternoon off, you take the bike across the bridge and find yourself standing in front of a deeply discounted Cannondale, perfect for trail riding and for getting around town. What's wrong with it? You ask the sales associate. Nothing, she says. We just accidentally bought 10 instead of two. Fingers slipped on the order button. It's less than $400 and your debit card works. You pick up the cheapest helmet they have and ride back home. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Now, please. Now, please. <laughs> I, yeah. Want to ride my bicycle. I want to ride my bike. I find Roscoe's van. Please let me up my stamina. Please. I did it. 
Okay. Now, Hobland, my man. My strength? Six days. That won't leave me good for anything else, but I'll do it. Six six days. Done. No, now I'm done. Now I'm done. You bike back to your cabin. Great. Oh no, now I can't go talk to talk to anybody else because I wasted so much time trying to figure out that I have to buy a bicycle. <laughs> Just another day in the life of Sierra. No work today, so it's a long day of patrolling in lupus form, honing your knowledge of your new territory where the map ends and the quiet, forgotten, spirit-haunted places begin. You return home, warm up some oatmeal for dinner, ugh, and open Elton's copy of The Order of the Invisible World by Casimir Lubiask. Adventurer, scholar, defrocked priest, and alleged necromancer, Casimir Lubiask helped establish the three families in the New World, and his book is supposed to be an invaluable guide to the local spirits, even centuries later. You can't make heads or tails of it, but Elton wants you to read it anyway. Werewolf homework, great. You're just settling into the useful stuff, spirit names, when you hear a thump outside your cabin door. Fuck. Thump. Fucking watch out. I listen in and try and hear what's going on. Pull it up by the straps, dumbass. You know that voice. One of the Gultiers. Oh, one of them. The landlord's kids. Or the landlord. You edge into the kitchen and, I, and lean against the back door, listening. Then you spring away as someone falls into that door. It's not well made and it splinters, then lands with a terrific slap, hard enough to crack linoleum. Todd Gultier, the younger of the two brothers, stares at you with stupefied horror for a second, then gets up and runs out the door. He just keeps on running, heading for the airfield. Oh shit. That's Drax, his oldest brother, his older brother, staring from you to the ruined door. Drax wears a thin gold lined Bitcoin shirt, of course he does, and track pants. His gloved hands are filthy with black dirt and his box fresh sneakers are ruined. Next to him, you can see a blue plastic tub that's broken open, spilling what appears to be a mix of fake gold watches, silver coins, and medals, and baggies labeled only with numbers across the dirt. <laughs> Drax, what exactly are you doing with pirate treasure and drugs? Shut the fuck up and get this stuff inside! No! Drax hisses. He looks around as if the cops are going to scream up your dirt road at any moment, then hauls the broken tub over the threshold and into your kitchen, pushing it across the cracked linoleum until it bangs against the splintered door. Drax, what are you- I told you to shut the fuck up! <laughs> Drax snaps, peering out the kitchen window. Are you alone? You feel your rage threatening to spike, but then the tub breaks open completely, spilling tacky fake Rolexes across your socks like you just won the jackpot at a carnival. It's a little funny. Okay, look, this will have to stay here, Drax says, wrestling the door back up and into position. Someone will pick it up in a few days. Might be a while, especially now that Terry ain't no good. He fumbles in his pocket, pulls out a vape pen, <laughs> and takes a long, shuddering drag. Who's Terry? Jesus Christ, what is happening here? This is mental. I know we're not supposed to do murder, but I don't like him. No, I know. The fucking- Are you stupid? The guy who lived here before you. He breathes out a cloud of smoke. Look, I can't move this tonight, so all you gotta do is watch it for two nights. We'll just move some stuff through. Not a lot. It won't be a problem. It'll be chill. So is this gonna be a regular thing, or- Did I say you could fucking ask questions? Oh my god. Drax snaps. Get this shit cleaned up. Oh my god. Now, I'll send Todd back tomorrow to fix the door so no one notices how you live like a fucking animal. We're going to move things around through here every few weeks, whatever. And if you ever, ever think of stealing any of it, you're fucking dead. Do you hear me? Ooh. Ooh. Okay, I can either have him cut me in, or I can tell him he doesn't get shit out of my house right now. I'm going to feed you those watches. And that's what I'm going to say. I could try and cut him in for a percentage, but I don't want anything to do with him. I don't like him. Drax, if you don't get your shit out of my house right now, I'm going to feed you those watches. Listen, bitch, Drax says. You're going to do what I... You grab his throat and squeeze just right until he's flailing helplessly at your wrists. Then you let go and he drops onto the linoleum. I see you around again, or any of your cronies. I'm going to break both your legs and throw you in the Connecticut River. Take your shit and don't come back. Fortunately for Drax, he came prepared with trash bags. He bags everything up, never looking at you, and heads for the doorway. You grab him by the back of his tracksuit and fix the door. You have 12 hours. I love it. This is the only time Sierra gets to feel like a badass. He nods, then scrambles back to his truck. 
Drax's younger brother Todd shows up the next morning and immediately falls to his knees, screaming, I'm not a crony, Sierra! You gotta believe me! You let him fix the door. He does good work. Fuck me. <laughs> what the hell is that? Um... Okay. Jeez. Let's go talk to Melody. Uh, she talked about those brick prisons we saw in Hadley. Let's go talk to her about that. Maybe we can squeeze in some backstory while we're on it. You text her at work, but Melody's Wi-Fi is spotty and she spends much of her time fixing up the barrows. So it's a bit of, of a surprise when Melody, Elton, and Nin all show up while you're having dinner in your cabin. So I figured it out, Elton says, helping himself to your soup. No, I figured it out, Melody says. You call this a soup? The three Bs, Nin says, after sticking her finger in the pot and sucking on it. My germs. Bacon, beans, and barley. More like botulism, Melody says, dipping a bowl into your pot. Anyway, it's a really interesting story. Wait, this is Facon, right? Or Vacon or Tofacon? <sighs> She nudges, she's a vegetarian. She nudges the chunks around. I played a werewolf vegetarian for the playtest for Werewolf 5th Edition. I loved it. Those are onions, you say, a bit forlorn. You waited so long for them to caramelize and they never did. Disgraceful, Melody says. So this was, so this fight was back in the 60s and it really put Broadbrook on the map. And like their spiritual battles in the 2000s led to the downfall of the Vermont Yankee nuclear plant, Elton thinks their fight here led to the founding of the EPA. The EPA fought the Ghostbusters, Nin adds, and the Department of Education fought the Blues Brothers. <laughs> She's filled a mug with your soup and is sipping thoughtfully. I love Nin. Nin's amazing. I said it was possible, Melody, Elton says. The point is that the, is that the thing the Broadbrook Garu killed back in the 60s was so spiritually huge that not even the Ascendant Worm could break it down into its component parts and recycle it. Weird to think that the worm's real function, the cosmic recycler. The spirit world used to function. That's hard to imagine now. I mean, that's fair enough. <laughs> Getting some use out of that new dot and strength. Yes. Yes, I am. I love that the werewolves are always starving. <laughs> it's so, it's such a mood. It's such a vibe and I love it. It's absolutely something I'm putting into my own chronicle. And it's not even clear what went wrong with this spirit, Elton says. Back then, Garu were always quick to blame the worm, like Puritans blaming bad harvests on the devil. But we don't know if this spirit was of the worm. We just know that it took out an entire cairn on Cape Cod, tore a hole through Boston. In his writings, Chains the, Chains the Lie says it was Cockroach, the old patron spirit of the Glasswalkers. When it became poisoned by radiation, the Garu had to put it down, and the Glasswalkers subsequently became Spider's Tribe. But Greynail says it was the mother of all Nexus crawlers, a living rip in the Umbra, but bigger than anyone had ever seen before. And Jane said it was something alternately called Oblivion, the mouth of Yomi, or the Black Sun. The point, Melody says, is that not even the dead know what died here in the 60s, but they're all afraid of it. Apparently my sister even explored whatever realm or reality this thing came from. Could this be an alchemist thing? Maybe we should talk to some of the human occultists. Especially, uh, I read the word oblivion and I go, meh. The only human I would have trusted with this is Harmony, Elton says. But I have Harmony's notes, Melody says, and everything chains the lie wrote about it. I can seal it up again and maybe even learn something. Sorry, Melody, Elton says, but you should not be messing around with unfamiliar rights. I have a right that will let us seal this kind of umbral rift on our own. And it won't draw the attention of Giselle or the Cult of Fenris. I remember Giselle. I don't like her. I hate her. Just spackle over it, really, Melody says. We'll have a much better time with the stuff Harmony and Chains the Lie wrote. We might even be able to see inside. Clumsy monkey magic, Nin says, having finished her mug of soup. Our job is to heal the spirit world. Let's get the help of the local spirits. They are not diminished by action, but strengthened. Our goal is to heal this land. They start to argue, and worse, they've eaten all of your soup, and they're starting to open up the cabinets. Oh my god. You decide, you need to decide who you're taking with you to the site before they find, too late, they found the Girl Scout cookies you were saving. So you need to decide before they find the frozen waffles. Um, Nin. I love Nin. I mean, I, I picked this to go with Melody, but since everybody's here, I want to go with Nin. We need to heal the forest, not just ward it against threats. Nin and I will go. I love Nin so much the best. 
Nin is so engrossed by eating Girl Scout cookies that she barely acknowledges you. Nonetheless, she's there again tomorrow night in her lupus form, leaping with excitement. You wrap the chains around your body, change, and follow her across the Connecticut River to the site. She grabs the chains with her teeth, then suddenly leaps and disappears. Into the night woods? Into the umbra? You've lost her. You range back and forth using your enhanced sense of smell, and then have the good sense to duck under a fallen log as Nin leads a stampede of pony-sized umbral spiders over the brick structures. The chains swirl up into the sky, are remade and reformed, then descend with a bright spiritual radiance over the structures. You look away, and when your eyes are no longer dazzled, you examine the site. The bricks are totally restored, each one marked with a Garu sign. You instinctively reach out with your hand, and your paw touches a brick that's hard as steel. I love Nin. She's the best. Um... Just out of curiosity, now that I have Melody here, um, I'm going to visit Melody. Now that I have Melody here, I wonder if I can do the, the Falcon of Many Faces thing. I actually don't know if I can or not. Because I want to. Nin is in fact the best. Absolutely. All right, let's go visit Melody really quick. You start by texting Elton one morning since you're not sure where Melody lives. The three families were quite wealthy once, and you expect that if Nin gets a mansion, however dilapidated, so does the last palace, so you don't expect Elton's answer. She's at the Barrows. The cemetery? Where David Beninsky was. You should be able to find her near there. I have to work a double shift because my co-worker is back in chemo. Please check in on Melody and make sure she's okay. So after a long day trying to work through the staff in full crisis mode because another Alzheimer's patient walked out, you bike up to the veterans hospital and then cut through the woods to the defiled landscape where David Beninsky hid the corpse of Jasper Heaney. That was gross. It's a scorching hot summer afternoon when you return to the barrow. You find it almost completely reclaimed by nature, except for a few heaps of concrete, nothing remains of David Beninsky's workshop. The crude dam he constructed or the pen for the horses he mutilated. The landscape is a th is a thousand shades of green, ferns, moss, leaves, and sedges. The water flows fast and clear. Insects and birds call from the trees. Hello, Sierra. She's gorgeous, my god. Melody stands halfway up the barrel where you confronted David Beninsky, smiling hugely, a net full of human and animal bones slung over one shoulder. She wears a tattered gray tank top, Toby trousers, and mud-splashed Wellington boots. Her curly hair is up and out of the way, piled on top of her head with ribbons in the style of an ancient Roman matron. That is what it looks like, which makes you think she knew you were coming. Just, short, <laughs> just sorting out the remains of the dead, David left a terrible mess. Smiling hugely, showing perfect white teeth and an expression that would cause most kinds of apes to attack her. She holds up a human skull with a bullet hole in it. Um... So you look very, um, fit. Damn, she looks amazing. And if she didn't look so dangerously crazy, I'd tell her so more clearly. Yes. <laughs> yes. With my one charisma, let's try and riz her up. It's good to feel the sun again, Melody says. Wait, isn't fit what British people call hot guys? I... I mean, yes. In German, if you say that you're fit, that just means that you're, um... It doesn't mean that at all. Like, you know, say, you know... It's like saying, are you ready? Like, if you ask someone if they're fit, what, they, what you mean is, uh, are you ready? Like, are you ready to go? <laughs> I think Elton told me that once, the Philodox says. She stares into the eyes of the skull, looking absolutely nothing like Prince Hamlet as the summer wind catches her long curly hair. Oh my god. <laughs> Sierra's in love. It's crazy. <laughs> I love it. Um, I like your... Um, what kind of pants are those, you ask? You worry you're striking out. Melody is so erratic that she's leaving you a bit tongue-tied. But she turns to blast you with a radiant smile, then says, These are Japanese worker trousers. David had a bunch of them hanging around from before he welled up into a leather monster. I had to scrape off some blood, but I think it was just horse blood. Aren't they cute? She does a spin. They're very cute. Why don't you come inside, Melody says, smiling as she walks among the barrows to a small grassy hill and a white double door you didn't notice before. The door is made of what appears to be marble and opens at her approach into a fully furnished chamber. You recognize some of the chains that control the door mechanism. They're the same design as the ones you saw in Ashfield. 
My sister's work, Melody says. Harmony was an amazing alchemist and metallurgist. She made incredible things, but well, she was only human. This kills humans. She shows you her skull. Is that your sister's, you ask? It is, Melody says. We were good friends in addition to being sisters, so I'm keeping her for a while until I can learn to be less emotional about her death. <laughs> the smell of roasting meat hits you once you're inside. When your eyes <laughs> always when your eyes adjust, you see what happens to be an entire deer leg on a spit. Copper mirrors are positioned to reflect light from outside, and lamps are set to provide illumination when the sun goes out. The cattle falc is gone, and now you can see that the room where you confronted David Beninsky was a mere vestibule, an entryway for a much larger chamber. The sight of the room is so unexpected and alien that it's momentarily overwhelming. Heavy oak furniture, green and gold tapestries, agent leather brown books piled up in an enormous bookcase built into the whitewashed stone wall, and faceted pieces of cut glass to amplify the light. Melody, you remind yourself, was born into this twilight world under the hill and grew up among the three families. Even her accent, you now realize, carries old world inflections. The white doors close slightly, sealing you in with an open fire and the reflected sunlight. Let me clean myself up and then we'll eat, Melody says. Sit wherever. She, she strips with them the same... She strips with the same casual ease with which she changes shape, dropping her clothes in a wicker basket and then loosening her hair so it flows down her back to stop around her thighs. That is long hair. I have long hair, but that's really long hair. Her limbs are long and pale, her body toned. She looks slim in the firelight, but has a solid solidity to her and a latent heat as if her bones are the same copper as the mirrors. You try not to stare. The Philodox steps around a painted screen to where you can hear water. The river appears to have been diverted partly under the hill, which provides her running water. So is it customary for Silver Fangs to attend to the dead? That's not a traditional part of the litany. It's nice to see that even Silver Fangs can bend to necessity. I mean, I, I don't want to jump right into asking about the Battle of Grey's Farm. We're going to eat. <laughs> Silver fangs do what is necessary, Sierra, Melody says, her voice high and clear over the burbling water. Soap and lotions tickle your nostrils. When we have subjects, we rule. When we do not, we get our hands dirty. It's not so bad. I told you once that to be a werewolf is to be changed, to be without a solid core. We must find a way to move through the worlds, and with so many dead, my duty is to the dead. The silver fang emerges from her bath, dressed in a long green robe, hair in a golden fillet, cheeks and feet rosy from the cold water. <clears throat> Wearing what appears to be a necklace of thumb-sized emeralds, she smiles graciously, then her eyes widen. The fucking roast! Melody shrieks, pad pad padding past you with bare damp feet to smack at the burning deer haunch with her damp towel. You hadn't noticed because of the smell from Melody's bath, but it looks like the chains that turned the roast got tangled. She manages to douse the flames. Oh, it's ruined, she wails. Oh my god. Though it looks like only a small area is burnt beyond edibility. Then she notices her loaf of honey wheat oatmeal bread, which has fallen to the floor in the commotion and bursts into tears. <sighs> um, there, there. Please don't cry. Uh, just a cot of things. <laughs> I know. <laughs> You didn't know I'm a huge fan of the Akata as well. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Melody says, wiping at her face. I just, I wanted a nice dinner. GD, I've been, become my mother, screaming that all she wants is a nice Thanksgiving for once, and I'm ruining it. She centers herself, then inspects the roast and says, It should be okay. Here, why don't you sit down? Do you want a flagon of mead? Oh, no, I forgot to buy mead. I can have wine, you say quickly, spotting a bottle in the shadows. Melody relaxes and retrieves the wine. You spot the corkscrew where it fell to the ground and hand it to the philodox before she loses her temper again. The deer haunch is a bit tough and under-seasoned, but the bread is a little dusty thanks to its roll on the floor, and the salad is perfunctory at best, but you're not stupid enough to complain. And the robust red wine Melody found is actually an excellent pairing with the venison. Also, you're too young to buy wine. Oh, that's right. I keep forgetting that. I'm 19, so in America, I can't, like, legally buy alcohol. <laughs> so this is a rare treat. Once she calms down, Melody is a charming and intriguing host, though you remain on guard in her strange underground kingdom. Why am I flirting with someone so much older than me? That's, that's just me, baby. That's just Sierra, baby. 
get into it. The Silver Fang is a paradox. At one moment, she's a woman barely older than you. Oh, is she? Oh, that's lovely. Eager to simulate the adult ritual of a dinner party and not quite sure how. She's desperately eager to impress you, which is nice, as you're not sure anyone has ever bothered to try impressing you before. Then from one breath to the next, you sit across from a queen of life and death. You can't remember where the door is, and you can't quite seem to understand the shape of the room you're in. You're going to get out of here, right? <laughs> Dessert is melted ice cream. The box wasn't cold enough, but it's pretty good when Melody turns it into a milkshake with some cream and berries. Berries and cream. She pours the last of the wine into hers and mixes in honey. You still don't see any exits and the fire has died down, leaving the chamber illuminated by candles and a single oil lamp made of copper and faceted glass. Melody is plainly tired. For all her aristocratic airs, she just spent all day throwing cinder blocks out of a bog. But as you linger over dessert, you probably have time for one more question. Ah, oh, let's be nice to her. You're a charming hostess, Melody. Thank you for having me here. Let's be nice to her because she seems sad. Your very light flirting seems to throw her carefully cultivated manners into disarray. Whoops. Uh, what? Thank you, she says. She looks at her older sister's skull as if for advice. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> what do you think, wax fungus? Then seems to realize that you can see her turning to a skull for advice. Harmony... <laughs> Harmony was always more reserved than I was, but I turned to her when I needed to understand people. I always had. She gestures with the fish knife that she's been using to eat venison. Lots of friends, you know, but no one really close. Hey, how are the Bruins... <laughs> Boston Bruins? How are the Bruins doing this year? I haven't been paying attention. I have no idea. Maybe it's good that Melody likes you enough that she babbles when you express interest. Melody drains the last of her milkshake, then looks around as if Churl's in gilded sil what as if churls and gilded slave collars are ready to whisk the dishes away what does that look like i'd like someone to describe i'd like to someone to show me what that expression looks like on a face <laughs> i guess i can't picture it so we're dating melody now nice i mean i like her she's nice it's weird because melody's my sister's name but i like her a huge fan of the Silver Fangs. If again, I like all the tribes for different reasons, but huge fan of the Silver Fangs. Um, <laughs> what does that look? Uh, I lost my place. Not even their uh, da, 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 da. not even their ghosts remain. She sighs. Rushing water below. The torrent freed from David Beninsky's tyranny months ago. The Philodox rubs her eyes, then looks around and realizes that there are no exits and that you're trapped here. Pull the chain over there, she says, gesturing to what you're pretty sure is the way deeper into her barrow. Nonetheless, you rise and give it a gentle tug. The huge white stone doors you entered through slide open without a sound. Follow the lanterns, Melody says. They'll take you home. I like her a lot. Oh, and the Bruins were knocked out of round two of the Stanley Cup. Deep sigh. <laughs> I don't know if you're joking or if that's a true statement, but that would have been a perfect thing for me to be able to say as I was leaving. It's warm when you leave, but you can feel the nights growing darker, the days growing shorter, even here in the summer. Maybe it's a property of these lonely tombs to partake of endings and the harvest. Little remains of Broadbrook's glory. I thought I restored it. I got the achievement for some reason. But as you start to walk your bike, oh yeah, my bike, pale fires dance across the flowing water. You follow them to a row of crooked stones that lead across a river, then down to a wide trail that edges around the defiled broad brook to a quiet forest clearing. And there I am, waiting for you atop a lightning struck stump. Hello, Sierra. How have you been? Keeping warm? Getting enough calories? Spirit, I'm starting to think that you're manipulating events. Also love you, though. The physical world and the Umbra are mirrors, Sierra. I love Stormcat, even if I am... I, 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 I'm I getting the impression Stormcat's sus. Like, I always knew, but I love her still. I am the principle by which events come to take place. Ask Elton for a copy of Aristotle's Physics and review the multiplicity of causes if you don't understand. Anyway, I have heartening news. The spirits have come to a decision regarding the survivors of Broadbrook. They are a pack worthy of the name. 
As I glide through the shadows cast by Gorsky Manor's high brick walls, you can almost see whatever is behind this body I wear, whatever is so huge and so far away that my form can barely conceal it. But it remains concealed, mercifully, for if you saw it, you would know the same pitiful rat-souled fear you inflict upon mortals, little Garu. What do you think about your new companions? Be honest. The compulsion washes over you, calling upon you to ruthlessly scrutinize your packmates for weakness. Is this what it's like, you wonder, to be a shadow lord? I was just thinking the same thing. Elton still mourns his dead wife. He ignored his duties to Gaia for years as his companions fought or suffered alone. That's factual, though. That's a fa just a factual statement. Oh, it's sadly true, but it would have been funny if Kyle was that up to date. <laughs> I mean, he could have just made it up. Um, Nin might have wolf wisdom, but we needed someone who can act and fight. All she does is tag along and play guitar. That's not true. I watched her fight a tree. That's not true. Melody got herself trapped by some two-bit corn spirit and sat around in a daze for three years. I expected more from the self-styled rulers of the Garu Nation. That one's kind of true. But I like Melody, so I'm not going to say it. I'm going to say the Elton one, because the Elton one's just like, there's no denying that one. Elton has twisted his soul and imagines that he can live life as a mortal occultist, accruing all the benefits of his knowledge and power as a Garu while never offering the services Gaia asks in exchange for all she has given him. He knows that his situation is untenable and that soon the great god Vaughn, wearing my face, will, thunder, will force him to take up his duties again. He knows his obligations to the tribe of the Shadow Lords. In fact, I am here to speak about tribes and the obligations they entail. You need a tribe, Sierra. I do. With the pack partially restored, I have regained some of my status, and I have spoken to the great spirits of the Garu Nation. Some have expressed interest in you. I am always hesitant to offer praise, but you have done well since arriving here, Sierra. I have mentioned your name to Vaughn, the Lord of Darkness and Calamity, and he would accept you among the Shadow Lords. If you wish to join us, seek us in our temple high above the Barrows of the Dead." The Stormcat's words also make you think of the Silverfangs, the spirit's blue eyes flash. I know that you once considered joining the Silverfangs, something that would have been once considered audacious, even mad for a cub like you. Times have changed, but in many ways the Silverfangs have not. The ancestors and their great lord Falcon know of you, but you have not yet earned their praise. Damn it! <sighs> if you wish to assert your authority, the statue of Falcon waits in the old temple, not far from the great statue of Vaughn. A tribe of your own, if you can prove yourself worthy, of course. Before you can ask any more questions, though, I slip back into the Umbra, leaving you alone with your thoughts and a confused stray cat. You bag some leftover meatloaf. <laughs> I want a tribe. I want a... I know that you once considered joining the Silver Fangs, but you have not yet earned their praise... All right, let's try. Ooh, some of the spirits like me a little bit. Some of the spirits like me a little bit. Chiminage, glory seven, honor five, wisdom eight. Some of the spirits like me. All right, I return to Falcon with many faces. What is it that you want from me? You'll need to spend four nights in honorable chiminage to earn a gift. However, in exchange for this work, the spirit promises to tell the blackbirds and starlings about your honorable deeds in addition to granting you his gift. This falcon is actually closer to the heart warden tribe. The only way this new spirit would agree to teach you is if you swore to serve stag, though you suspect that even if you become a warden, heart warden, your commitment to the litany is insufficient for the spirit despite the honor you've learned. Okay. But I can. Ugh. Okay. I'm going to join the Heart Wardens. I celebrate Stag and join the Heart Wardens. Because I want to. So I'm going to. This is my decision. Squirrel's Gift is very useful. I'm sure it is. But I want a tribe. I want it. Gimme. I dream of a language whose words like fists would fracture jaws. Broadbrook had a few heart wardens at the time of the Battle of Graves Farm, but they were too young and untried to mark the Umbra with their legends. On the other hand, many servants of Stag visited these lands, built standing stones, shaped the game trails that eventually became roads, then highways. 
But the people of the map didn't find all the old roads, and even now, the Garu who serve stag and who never called themselves wardens wait beyond the lichen-coated statue that they carved 1,500 years ago. Their eyes glitter in the summer woods, then suddenly and all at once they run and you join them. The stag is fleeing, but you and your packmates work together to bring it down. You know why, too. To feed myself, to clothe my weak homid flesh, to wear the crown of a great chief. Your fellow Garu laugh at your presumption, but stag celebrates your pride. He kicks and leaps, and your fellows stop laughing as you sink your fangs into the spirit's ephemeral flesh. The others swarm stag, and though he keeps struggling, you all know that this is a game, this is a right. Eventually, somewhere far out beyond the circle of the moon, you bring him down, and all of you tumble back out of the umbra into the physical world. The time-lost heart wardens who ruled this land before the shadow lords of Europe slaughtered them vanished, replaced by Nin, Elton, and Melody. You're all in lupus form, terrifying at spirit stuff, swallowing silvery star blood as Stag fades away. But he remains visible to you, pleased by what you have asked of him, to thrive and grow strong. He blesses you and the world vanishes again into silvery light. Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> yeah, I was unlucky and unlocked the urban blight area last and just had to wait to unlock Glass Walker. Ah, oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I could wait. I'm sure I could, but I would like this. The rest of the night is a blur that reminds you of the day after your first change, with triumph replacing shame. Nin plays acoustic covers of cliche werewolf songs. Elton cooks brats over an open fire, and Melody is frantically sketching Garu glyphs in a notebook. Preparatory work for the runes she'll add to the stones to inform ancestors and spirits of your new status. Aww. Meanwhile, all you can do is try to understand your new senses. Like with your first change, nothing and everything is different. You eat and drink until you can understand what things smell and taste like again. Then walk until you feel your legs under you. Gaia moves beneath you, impossibly massive, impossibly wounded. Dying, but not dead yet. You're sure of it. When you awaken, Melody has left an artifact from the Barrows, a plain red clay bowl once sacred to indigenous Garu, who are members of what modern werewolves call the Heart Wardens. Elton told you about this artifact once. When they failed to protect their lands, the old Garu would cut out their livers and leave it in this bowl. You hope that Stag will not ask so much from you if you fail. Damn. Love it. Um, I don't have enough now to do squirrel. <laughs> I don't have enough to do anything now. I have eight for Knights of Wisdom. Oh, God. Don't have enough glory. I'm sorry, Squirrel. I'm sorry. Um, so now what does Falcon want? Okay. Um, yep. As a warden, you're familiar with ancient packs. Um... Both deer-headed Egyptian gods. You'd need to demonstrate a greater commitment to the litany before it agreed to give you its gift. I had a greater commitment to the litany, and I screwed it up somehow. Damn it. Um, does anybody take wisdom here? Probably not Fox. Nope. <laughs> he disapproves of your serious ways. Does everyone disapprove of me? I think I've talked to everyone. They all disapprove of me. It's fine. I'm used to it. Um, yas, yas. I... Ooh, need to know more about the cult of Fenris. I should search for Heinrich online. Let's do that really quick. Unlike mortal occultists, Garu can be cavalier about the need for secrecy. I trust that the delirium will fog memories and confuse searches enough to keep them safe. Oliver Boone III is particularly sloppy with his Heinrich alter ego, which a non-computer person like you can connect to his professional identity at Hovid Development. Despite several false starts at one, Heinrich doesn't really have a manifesto, so you have to assemble his position and beliefs from dozens of forum posts and website comments. My god. To sum up, inspired... <laughs> the original incel. Summed up, <laughs> inspired by the Northwest Territorial Imperative, which saw white nationalists flock to the Northwest U.S. states in an attempt to establish a white ethnostate. Heinrich has spent years looking for an ideal place to organize the cult of Fenris alongside an ideologically compatible human population that will settle a sparsely inhabited, politically vulnerable, and ecologically lush territory. From what you can gather from clues scattered around dozens of websites, after a failed attempt in Maine, he settled on western Massachusetts. 
Heinrich's plan is to establish what he calls a clean population of humans brought in from all over the United States, place them in positions of power, especially among the police and emergency services. What the hell is that plan? That's awful. But what about Gaia? I thought the cult claimed to be the true defenders of the Earth. Is there anything like that in here? You do not, under any circumstances, have to hand it to the cult of Fenris, but Heinrich actually does outline an environmentalist vision for his actions. On several occasions, Heinrich addresses militant anarchists and fringe environmentalists that he obviously thinks he can flip. He's clever and subtle, weaving together an apocalyptic vision that pits good and simple people willing to defend their land on one side and the machinations of industrialist bankers and the military forces they control on the other. He also presents a kind of anarchist, agrarian, pastoralist world of healing after the war is won, where small self-sufficient communities maintain themselves in accordance with nature. This is old-fashioned deep ecology focused on populations rather than consumption. Heinrich throws some numbers around at one point, estimating the need for an immediate 10% population reduction, mostly among low-performing races. Whoa! Low-performing races in Africa and South Asia. Followed by a 50% reduction managed through local governance that can enforce the laws of nature. You do find one interesting concrete fact. A forum poster who is almost certainly another cultist asks, why Western Massachusetts? And Heinrich answers in a straightforward and bewildering fashion because of how the locals failed at Vermont Yankee. Vermont Yankee was a nuclear power plant just over the northern border within the Broadbrook Cairns territory. It was shut down in 2014. Clay told you that the great, great Cairn to the east destroyed it, and their victory encouraged him and his pack to bring down the pipeline. So what the hell is Heinrich talking about? You consider heading up there, but that sounds like the sort of place that calls for a whole pack of werewolves, so not yet. Um, and to finish up our cultist research, let's, uh, track down Conrad Merritt. Unfortunately, you don't know much about investigation because I have no dots in it. Online or off, without a lead, you don't know where to begin. I have no dots in investigation. Oh, man. Okay, it's time to find Podge. Let's go, baby. <laughs> Are you sure you're ready? The journey to Holyoke may prove as dangerous and complicated as your last two major outings. I certainly hope so. Good God. And as soon as I get to the chapter opening, I'm going to end because my voice is dying. Um, Elton says, okay, first, did everyone read the news links I sent? I did. Angry, angry hippos. Yes, Elton, we read your little information packet. That must be Melody. Actually, you did not read all of it. Yes, I did. You hurry back to the packet and read up on the big calc. GRC Media is a font of information on the big calc. The core idea is simple. The equations necessary to understand fluid dynamics, how water flows, are unbelievably complex, as math-intensive as Big Bang research or the particle research they conduct at places like CERN. The big calc is a huge number-crunching operation that uses computational power from the Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing Center, linked computers at the college, and a propriety high performance system at Everlight Gas and Electric to solve certain previously unsolvable problems in fluid dynamics. Supporters, including local environmentalists that Everlight reached out to, according to one article, claim that the discoveries will lead to vast improvements in the, effic in the efficiency of hydroelectric dams and related renewable energy technologies, encouraging energy companies to move away from coal and petroleum towards renewables. Detractors argue that the sheer amount of energy required to perform these calculations, energy still drawn mostly from fossil fuels, is so enormous that it's not worth it. The arguments have raged back and forth on GRC Media's network for years, culminating in a protest outside an Everlight executive's house a few weeks ago, but the detractors haven't been able to stop the operation, which is scheduled for completion in just a few weeks. You return to the conversation and it doesn't look like anyone missed you. <laughs> That's all <we've laughs> That always feels good. Uh, Holyoke is... Oh god, Nin. Holyoke is called the Paper City. Did you attach a quiz too? Please quiz us, teacher. But it appears to be made of bricks. We'll leave on Friday. I'm playing at Pearl Street on Friday. And I have to work. Saturday, washing my hair. I love Melody. I'm in love with her. Um, you're joking, right? It takes a long time to be beautiful. And so it goes. After about an hour... Okay, fine. Wednesday. He spells Wednesday wrong. He spelled Wednesday wrong. 6 a.m. at the skate park. 
Nin, if you forget your clothes this time, I will tear my own face off and make you wear it. I will really do it this time. Sierra, you're on water bottle duty. Her water bottle smells like old people's lotions because of her job. I'll bring water. Oh my god. She remembers my job. <laughs> she remembers the detail about me, you guys. <laughs> it's happening. It goes on like this for another hour before it's all settled. Melody, Nin, and Elton are already waiting at the skate park, though it's still before sunrise. Holyoke is less than an hour from Northampton by bus, but your companions all want to scout the woods around Mount Tom, which lies between the two towns. You arrive an hour before dawn. The others have already taken on their lupus form, and several hundred pounds of canine fury are running around on the grass, gray and red. Whoa. The others have already taken on their lupus forms and several hundred pounds of canine fury are running around on the grass, gray and red and eye ser searing indigo. Oh, I wish I knew whose eyes belong to whom. Elton spots you first and gets everyone to look serious. The latecomer, you're tasked with helping Elton and Melody into their backpacks. Nin has apparently forgotten her clothes. Elton manages to express his frustration, even in lupus form. Then you head into the public bathroom and transform. You're all ready. It feels like running with a pack. There are only four of you, and of course, you bring up the rear, though you're a true Garu and Heart Warden now. Oh my god! Elton and Melody have spent more time as werewolves, and Nin was born a wolf. But, <laughs> but the experience represents a strange and exhilarating communion, like nothing you knew back home. As Nin rain ranges ahead so fast and far you can't even smell her, and Elton and Melody search the autumn woods around Mount Tom for spirits or signs of other habitation. You watch their backs, panting as you struggle to keep up. I took a dot in stamina. Man. I follow Melody. I follow Melody. <laughs> I love her. I follow Melody and try to learn from her what it is to be a leader of Garu. Mm. You follow Melody and learn that, apparently, the main function of a Silver Fang is to nudge people along whenever they get distracted. You need to reach Holyoke before sunset, but Elton wants to push his snout into every odd-smelling leaf pile and 18th century stone wall he can find, and Nin just wants to run through the autumn woods. So you and Melody range back and forth, reining in Nin before she gets too far ahead, then yipping at Elton whenever he stops for too long. Melody seems happy to have a deputy sheepdog. Oh my god, I'll be your deputy, Melody, under her command. Or maybe she's just happy that you're not wandering off in a third direction, making her work that much harder. The four of you enter Holyoke from the west, first loping across the highway in the early afternoon, then regaining your homid forms at a dog park. I hate using dog parks, Melody says as she fluffs her hair in the public bathroom's cracked mirror. My ancestors weren't dogs. They were the most ferocious of northern gray wolves and cabinet makers, I think. <laughs> Since Holyoke is a mid-sized city, you've dressed as well as you can manage, which means black tactical gear. Maybe you can pass yourself off as private security. Once everyone is back on two legs, Elton tosses Nin a dress and sandals he brought in case she forgot her clothes, which she did. Everyone adjusts their clothing and climbs onto the bus heading downtown. The bus deposits you on a barren, treeless street surrounded on all sides by brick and concrete buildings. The heart of a decaying industrial town alongside the Connecticut River. The city looks hollowed out and so do its inhabitants, who seem to scurry for cover like they fear sniper fire. The air smells bad, old coal, old toxins, 19th century industry lingering on, invisible to poison the young. I'm going to talk to Patrick, Helton says. Why you, Melody says. He never liked you, he liked me. He wanted to shag you, Elton says. Get in line! <sighs> and no... I'm so sorry. And no, I want to secure the armory. While we reacquaint ourselves, Sierra, I want you to see what you can learn about Director Sullivan. And there are rumors that his company, Everlight, captured something. See if you can learn anything about that. Text me for emergencies. Otherwise, we'll meet Melody at six. <laughs> oh my god. Um, okay. Wandering around a place I don't know sounds like a good way to get captured and dissected. Fair. Most of what we do doesn't involve fighting monsters, you know, Elton says. Sometimes humans make nuisances of themselves all on their own. And if one of them pulls a gun on you, break his legs. The Thayerge turns to Nin, and I want you to get up somewhere high and say hello. The fall of the Broadbrook Cairn means other werewolves might be moving in, not just the Cult of Fenris. If they're here, find them. 
Nin turns, Elton grabs her shoulder and puts the location of your meetup point, the Holyoke Armory, into her phone, then sends her on her way. Melody makes for the armory and Elton heads deeper into the industrial district. In moments, you're alone in an unfamiliar city. And here we are, chapter five, the year, woo, the year made of glass. And I'm just going to go to the next page just in case it does update over the weekend. Shall I repeat that there are no locked doors? Shall I add that there are no locks? Jorge Luis Borges, the house of Asterian. All right, so we are in Holyoke. We are looking for Podge or Patrick um, to add to our pack from the Broadbrook Cairn. We're a heart warden now. Um, and we're in love, head over heels in love with Melody. That is where we're going to end our adventure of uh, Sierra, Guy as Deadly as Weasel. I think we did pretty good. When we, I mean, we had to kill a lot of people that we were trying to not kill in Ashfield, but we did it. We're good. And so, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm dying. I can't talk anymore. <laughs> I'm going to end this here, and I'll see you again on Thursday for more Book of Hungry Names. This game's amazing. Get it if you haven't. And uh, thank you so much. Have an awesome weekend.